broadcasting live from the School of Athens. This is Europe and the People Without History with Mr. Olson, everyone's favorite AP World History Review Service. So I've got a bonus video coming for you today, and this one's going to be about post-World War I political changes. We're going to take a little bit of a tour of the world here, and we're going to, we're going to talk about how World War I impacted places around the world. So to begin, we need to understand one thing. What is the West? Well, if you've ever seen the Crash Course video, The West and Historical Methodology, you will have had a very good introduction to that very topic. Now, for our purposes, we're going to define the West as places that have been overwhelmingly and pigmentationally influenced by Western Europe. So you will note that uh, the West is sort of this socially constructed, contrived idea that there's places in the world that um, stem from Judeo-Christian values and democratic style governments that are largely embodied by Western Europe, the United States, and Australia. What else do those places have in common? Well, most of them involve white people. So when you're thinking of the West, you can think of the white people. Generally, that works kind of, not it really with Russia, but, you know, we'll take it. It's, it's a good uh, heuristic that might be able to ben benefit you. So anyways, we're talking about places that are in the West, and we're talking about places that are not in the West. So let's start with the West, because that's what everybody does. So let's talk about the most important post-war political change, and that would be what happens in Germany. So the con here, here's how I'm going to roll through all these places. I'm going to give you the historical context and like what happened prior to this. And most of them are going to have to do with World War I anyway, so you can kind of write that, that one off if you want. But then I'm going to tell you what the post-war political, er, political change was and the figures involved, the events that were involved, and the extent to which I think that that place changed. So let's go ahead and start with Ger Germany as our case study because I feel like the background not knowledge of this one is rather high. So the context is, of course, World War I. Germany got involved on the side of the not allies. So they were, of course, with Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire against Britain, France, Russia, the United States. So they lose that war, and at the Treaty of Versailles, they are absolutely hum humiliated. They are forced to accept all the war guilt, and they are forced to pay reparations to the tune of $33 billion over about 30 years. Now, even though they could have paid that, they didn't want to, and very quickly, an economic depression befalls the country. Now, it sort of befalls the country because of the forced reparations and because of the uh, economic turmoil that results Lar largely from no more wartime mo mobilization of the economy. But as a result of this, it makes an already disgruntled national populace even more disgruntled, and it allows for the conditions on which Hitler can rise to power. So the biggest political change we have here is a depression that leads to the rise of fascism. Key figure, of course, is Hitler. Key event, the rise of the Nazi party. It's important to keep in mind that Hitler was neither elected by the people, nor was his rise to power inevitable. Very easily could have been stopped had conservative politicians in Germany kept their wits, but they didn't, and as a result, you get the Nazis. Now, the extent of the political change in Ger Germany, I would argue, significant. Even though they had a democratic government shortly after World War I called the Weimar Republic, things quickly descend out of control. So we move on. Go to Germany's fascist friend, the Italians. The historical context, of course, is that they're in World War I. They start on the side of the Germans, but flip-flop in the war because that's what they do. And as a result, they end up on the winning side. Now they get a spot at the Treaty of Versailles, but they don't really get much of a say. The economic depression that grips the world grips them, and it allows for the conditions on which fascism can rise there too. Fascism actually uh, rises in Italy earlier than it does in Ger Germany. Nevertheless, their fa fascist dictator is named Benito Mussolini, who very famously made the trains run on time. Why did he do that? Well, he put more strict rules on the various train um, constituencies and people who ran the trains to make sure that the trains uh, did what they were supposed to. Uh, a key event that occurs between the war is uh, the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. If you recall from late in the, in the 1800s, Italy tried to invade Ethiopia, and they failed because Ethiopia is awesome. However, during this time, uh, Italy is just a little bit too much, and they're able to successfully invade and occupy Ethiopia beginning in 1935. This is important to keep in mind because it's an example of na nationalistic expansion, which, of course, is a key characteristic of a fascist dictatorship. Extensive political change here? Significant. Anytime you see the rise of a fascist dictatorship, 
we should argue that that is quite <clears throat> significant. Now, let's move our focus from the West to the non-West. So the non-West would be embodied by all those places that have red bubbles. We're going to start in Russia because they're kind of in the middle of the West and the non-West, and they're probably, in this whole presentation, the most important in the long run of changes that will occur after World War I. So the historical context of Russia is 300 years of an autocratic Romanov dynasty. So they had a czar that ruled much like a king, and an at some, 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 similar to an absolute monarchy. They enter World War I, but it goes very, very bad due to their slow industrialization, and as a result, they look for ways out. Now, the king, the, the czar at the time, Tsar Nicholas II, didn't want to leave the war. When he eventually is forced to abdicate the throne, thus leading to our first political change, he gives way to a provisional government that also doesn't want to leave the war. Now, that causes a lot of... Um, resentment among the people in Russia, and as a result, you get a communist revolution led by Vladimir Lenin, the guy pictured on the left. When he takes power as a result of the October Revolution in 1917, he begins to implement a Marx-inspired communist state. Now, his state is very bureaucratic, and as a result of that, many people aren't happy, and they fight back, causing a civil war that lasts from 1917 to 1922. After 1922, however, Lenin is victorious, and he's able to start implementing his communist regime. He dies quickly after and gives way to the totalitarian state that is going to be run by Stalin from 1924 to 1953. So, bad guy here. Uh, Lenin wasn't perfect, but definitely wasn't as bad as Uncle Joe. Extent of political change here, they went from a autocracy that had lasted for 300 years to a communist government. That would be significant. Let's take a field, field trip and go a little bit south and head to Turkey. Historical context of, of Turkey is, of course, they were a part of the Ottoman Empire. The uh, Ottoman Empire fights in World War I, loses, and as a result, falls apart. World War I is only a part of that, but uh, it's definitely important to keep in mind that it was an empire at the beginning of the war, and by about 1920, the empire is crumbling rather quickly. When Turkey emerges as a nation-state, it's led by a guy named Ataturk, or Mustafa Kemal. And he is pictured there on the slide, and you can tell that he looks like a fan fancy-pants Westerner. That's because he brings Westernization and secular Islam to Turkey. He wants to make them more like the West. Extent of political change here, they went from being a part of the Ottoman Empire and more strict Islamic rules to Westernized. That would be significant. Let's take a field trip further east and go to China. China's historical context, as you recall, the spheres of influence were carved out by the West. China attempted to respond by uh, giving into Westernization with self-strengthening reforms that failed. And that's best exemplified by their loss in the war to Japan that had successfully self-strengthened due to the Meiji Restoration. China had not, so they lose that war. You get a conservative backlash backlash that's embodied by the Boxer Rebellion and the rising power of Empress Dow Dowager Cixi. And eventually, this chaos leads to the abdication of the last Qing emperor and the establishment of the Republic in 1911. Now, the post-war change that's going to occur here is significant. The Chinese are snubbed by the Treaty of Versailles. They think that they are going to get various rights granted to, to them, and they do not. And this um, anti-Western sentiment that has already been brewing in chi China for a while spills over in, a May, in the May the 4th movement, which is a demonstration led by, you guessed it, students who advocate for Chinese autonomy in the face of encroaching Westernization. Now, this leads to a divide in the country between the, re the supporters of a republic led by a guy named Sun Yat-sen and the rise of a new political party, the communists. And the republic adherents and the communists go to a civil war that lasts for quite a while. Initially, the communists are led into the mountains and sort of uh, pushed into obscurity. But when Japan invades China in 1930, 31, the communists and the republic have to join forces to try and fight that invasion. And so you get figures like Chiang Kai-shek leading the republicans and Mao Zedong leading the communists come together to fight off the Japanese. This one's going to come to a head after World War II is over, so we'll put it on pause and revisit it later. However, extent of political change here, most significant, I would argue, of any of the non-Western places. Let's take a field trip south and go to India. 
And you'll recall the last time we left the Indians was um, they were mutinying against the British in the Sepoy Mutiny of 1857, which saw the dissolution of the East India Company and the establishment of the British Raj as a form of government. So they're under British control. They're a multi-ethnic state that has many Muslims and many Hindus in it, and they are involved extensively in World War I, sending many troops to fight with the British. After the war is over, they argue that since they helped fight for freedom of Britain from um, autocracy and despotism, that they should be freed from autocracy and despotism and should be granted independence. Now, this independence movement creates and sort of illuminates a divide between Hindus and Muslims that's going to come to a boiling point after World War II, so we'll leave that one right there. Now, India is granted limited autonomy by Britain because Britain hears what they're saying, but not total independence. Major figures leading the factions in this fight are Gandhi, who of course is fam famous for his salt march, a peaceful demonstration against Brit British control, and Muhammad Ali Jinnah, pictured here to the left of Gandhi, who is leading the Muslim League in India. The extent of political change here is it's no real material political change in that they're not given independence. However, it's definitely an increase in nationalistic consciousness of those people in India. Islamic forces in India want to have their independence. Hindu forces want to have their independence. But working this out is not going to be too easy. Next, let's go to Mexico across the pond and talk about how Mexico, if you recall, got its independence in the early 1800s, but was ruled by a dictator, Porfirio Diaz, from 1877 to 1911. Now, Diaz was replaced with de democratically elected Francisco Madero, who was assassinated. After he was assassinated, the United States helps a uh, leader by the name of Vittoriano Carranza come to power, and the people are not so happy. So after World War I, the country of Mexico establishes a liberal constitution which reinforces land-based inequality. It does not give land to the peasants who so diligently fought for and wanted land and resources to be able to live more fulfilling lives. As a result of this, you see revolutionary uprisings that were widespread throughout Mexico. They were led by people like Emiliano Zapata and his group known as the Zapatistas and a regional governing governor named Pancho Villa who also rises up against this new government created by the Nationalist Constitution in 1917. Extent of political change here? Very little, but they tried and they are inspirational. The last place that we're going to talk about now is Japan. Japan, which experienced the Meiji Restoration in 1868, had heavily westernized and by World War I was one of the world's main, main powers. They had beaten both China and Russia in a war and they had emerged on the world stage. As a result of World War I, though, they were incredibly angry. They were snubbed by the Treaty of Versailles, and even though they were allowed to attend, couldn't partake in the peace discussions. And the worldwide economic depression that befalls most of Western Europe and America also hits them. But because they, the, their government takes more control of the economy, they're able to get out of it faster. And they build their military up very, very quickly and they seek rapid military expansion in order to attain precious natural resources to fuel their industrialization because the island does not have it. And as a result, they find themselves at odds with the West and the world community. As a result, they leave the League of Nations and decide they are going to invade China and nobody is going to stop them. Major figure at the time, even though he doesn't really uh, play that much of a role as Emperor Hirohito pictured here, rather it is the military leaders of that country that are uh, leading the change. Extent of political change here, I would argue it's not really that great because they had been westernizing for a while, but it certainly is eye-opening, and the atrocities that they commit in China, definitely scary. So with all of that said, I hope that you have enjoyed this video, learned something from it. This is your Buddha, signing off.